Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyra Mariani, and I am the Executive Vice President at New America. Welcome to New America for those of you that are here for the first time. I am delighted that we are having a very important conversation this afternoon about punishment in the U.S. For those of you that may be unfamiliar with this particular, with the criminal justice system, you'll learn quickly that I think the criminal justice system is criminal in some of the ways in which it applies justice. We at New America are working, even though we, our society is buffeted by change, we are working for thriving families, individuals, and communities with the time, to have the time, stability, and opportunity necessary to lead productive lives. We work for equitable, accessible, and high quality education for all. We work for equal representation in politics and participation in accountable government. And we do that in part by telling stories about what's happening and what's possible. And we also do that by generating big and bold ideas to solutions, and I think you'll see that today. Our criminal justice system is in dire need of change. Imprisonment was originally intended to be used as a social deterrent and to protect those from those who commit crimes. It was intended for individuals to pay their debt to society be rehabilitated and then return to society as productive citizens. But instead of doing those things, we've made big business out of mass incarceration, with the U.S. holding the highest incarcerations um, and than anyone else in the world. We disproportionately arrest and incarcerate people of color, and though we have an error rate of one out of nine innocent people convicted, the death penalty death penalty still exists in some states. Though whites and African Americans use drugs at roughly the same rates, African Americans are imprisoned six times more than their white counterparts. And because of what you can and can't do once you re-enter society, recidivism rates are high. So that's just a teaser for what we'll get into this afternoon. We'll focus on solutions and all that and then some. And so with that, I want to turn it over to our moderator for this afternoon, Dr. Marsha Chatlin. Marsha is a 2017 Eric and Wendy Schmidt Fellow here at New America, and she's been a tremendous asset to our community. She also serves as the Assistant Professor of History and African American Studies at Georgetown, and has also written a book called Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great <coughs> Migration. Before I turn it over to Marsha, I should also mention that this conversation is being broadcast uh, via C-SPAN, so if you don't want to be seen, now's a good time to dip out. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to Marsha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure of moderating a conversation between two individuals who have helped us really look into the depth of this issue of punishment. I'll introduce our panelists and get started with the conversation. Professor Howard's class changed my life. This is what me and many of my colleagues at Georgetown have heard over the years about Mark Howard. Mark is professor of government and law at Georgetown University. He is the founding director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative, which brings together scholars, practitioners, and students to examine the problem of mass incarceration from multiple perspectives. He also teaches regularly in the Prison Scholars Program at the Jessup Correctional Institution, a maximum security prison in Maryland. His most recent book, do you have a copy of it for us to see, <laughs> is Unusually Cruel, Prisons, Punishments, and the Real American Exceptionalism, published by Oxford University Press in 2017. Mark received his BA in Ethics, Politics, and Economics from Yale University, his MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of California at Berkeley, and while being a professor, I don't know how he did it, his JD from Georgetown University. Welcome, Mark. In November of 2017, our second panelist's admission to the Connecticut State Bar was so moving, and in his words, quote, um, unlikely, that it warranted an article in the New Yorker entitled, A Poet with Prison Behind Him Becomes an Attorney. On that day, Reginald Dwayne Betts remarked, last time my mom saw me in a court, I was sentenced to nine years in prison. 
I know nobody expected this, least of all me. Reginald Betts is a husband and father of two sons, a poet and memorist. He is the author of three books, the recently published Bastards of the Reagan Era, the 2010 NAACP Image Award winning memoir, A Question of Freedom, and the poetry collection, Shahid Reads His Own Palm. Duane is currently enrolled in the PhD program in law at the Yale Law School, and he earned a JD from the Yale Law School, an MFA from Warren Wilson College's MFA program for writers, and a BA from the University of Maryland. Join me in welcoming Duane to this conversation. So Mark, I want to get started on your most recent um, research that really takes a comparative look at the criminal justice system. Um, we hear that our nation over-incarcerates its own citizens, but when we look at the conditions inside U.S. prisons from the perspective of other, what, of other places we deem developed, what did you find? Right, well, the starting point, I think, for a lot of studies of mass incarceration in the U.S., is to look comparatively and just look at the number of people, the percentage of people incarcerated, and it's a lot higher in the U.S. But most people just stop there. And so what I tried to do in my book and in my research is to actually go much deeper into all aspects of the criminal justice system and then also inside of prisons and see what takes place. And what I found is an actual horror show, which is to say that at every stage of what I call the criminal justice life cycle, which starts with plea bargaining, with sentencing, then prison conditions, rehabilitation, parole, and then reentry, the U.S. is off the charts, and I would say off the rails. So there's something that is distinctively American about this form of punishment, which is not just about making society safer, keeping people out of you know, the, the, the sort of protecting society by keeping dangerous people off the streets for a short period of time. It's about punishing people and punishing them severely and punishing them permanently. And this is something that's different. And so what I discovered in my work is that there are other countries that do it differently and there are other countries that do it better. And so why are we having this very insular little conversation at the U.S. where I think many people who look at it agree there are problems when the solutions are actually right there. There are better ways of doing it. And so that's what I try to draw on in this book and spell out, hopefully to lead to some common sense and some practical changes in the U.S. I want to touch upon this issue of the plea bargain yeah. because we know that we are in a crisis in terms of the ability for criminal defendants to get representation and we understand the ways that prosecutors have to deliver numbers in order to maintain their positions. And so what are some other models outside of the plea bargaining structure that you found compelling? Right, well, plea bargaining is something that shocks all of my students uh, when they first take my class because they all watch Law and Order and they watch movies and in every one of those, there's courtroom drama and there's you know, the zealous uh, you know, public defender making the case for his or her client and then it's sort of this balance and so on. The reality is vastly different. Right? Does anyone know what percentage of cases, of criminal cases, actually go to trial? Five percent, five percent, right? The rest are handled through plea bargaining. And that is something that is just astounding when you think about it. There's a constitutional right in this country to a trial by jury. But what happens is if you exercise that right, which is to say, if you turn down the plea bargain that has been offered to you in a very one-dimensional way, where it's basically said, here's the deal, take it or go to trial. And guess what? If you go to trial, you're probably going to get double that. I mean, there's a case that the Supreme Court sanctioned where somebody turned down a plea bargain for five years and got life without parole. The Supreme Court says that's okay. He had the chance, he turned down the deal. Right? This is unfathomable. And when I tell people from other countries about how this works, I mean, some countries you have a very modified, simplified form of plea bargaining in very specific conditions where there's an active role of the judge in ensuring the fairness of the process and so on. And it's for more minor cases, shorter term decisions in terms of sentences and so on. But there's nothing like what it is in the U.S. So that, in a sense, is stage one, but that alone is shocking and appalling in my view. Now, what's the solution to that? It's hard to say. We have so many cases that are coming forward, and they're already incredibly long delayed. So plea bargaining is deemed to be efficient, but it's ex incredibly unjust. And so the solution might be to build more courthouses, have more judges, and so on, or the solution might be perhaps not to prosecute so many people, to have more diversion, to have much more sensible forms of prosecution and seeking justice than what we do, which is this machinery of just cranking people through 
and plea bargaining is the prime mechanism for doing that. It's interesting when we think about the discretionary mechanism that allows for this to happen within the plea bargaining system, and then we think about um, mandatory sentencing. And I want to um, take this conversation to you, Duane, about the other part of this. So after we leave the courthouse and we think about the conditions inside um, prisons, particularly as they relate to juveniles and adult correctional facilities, what have some of your reflections um, touched upon in terms of the conditions in which people have to um, live out these sentences? Um, I should say, I'm, I, I, I found the plea bargain conversation interesting because because I, I think I agree. Well, I'm not sure if it should be more trials. But two, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't. I actually don't think it should be more trials. But, but I'm also not sure if the rate of plea bargains on its own is a problem. I think, How I, or even or even beyond that, is the fact that the amount of time that's available at the start is so intense that mm -hmm. there can't be a rational conversation on both ends. So if right. you if you face, and I, I have a friend who faced, who was offered five years for, for a murder. They offered him manslaughter for five years, and he pled not guilty, and he lost that trial, and he ended up getting 53 years. And now this is a case, in fact, in which he didn't commit the crime, and he maintained his innocence, and then 20 years later, a reporter did a story on him and, and, and found out that the police actually never even interviewed him before, char before charging him with the crime and that he didn't do it, and at the time he had an IQ of about 62, 63, his mother was mentally disabled, and so I, I do think that there are a lot of problems, but maybe the problem that we don't discuss enough is, is, is the sentence, the possibility of right. getting that 60 year sentence on the back end, because I think that's what perverts the, the whole plea bargaining process, mm -hmm. maybe even more so than the, than a, than the plea bargaining rate. And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I say that having, having pled guilty, to a crime, and I say they haven't pled guilty to a crime that carries a life sentence, and I, and I do think that part of the conversation has to try to get into the rationalization for why somebody would plead guilty, and I pled guilty because I committed the crime, and so I feel like we, we have to have room to acknowledge, so what does that mean to have committed a crime, and what does that mean to have pled guilty, and I was 16 years old, and the crime, I, I, I carjacked somebody, and, um, and I preface it and always say nobody was hurt, but people were um, my whole community was hurt, though, and I'm sure that the victim of my crime was 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 traumatized, and I don't know how long that trauma lasts. But but I think the question after that is, what should the punishment be? And um, when you ask, what is it like for a 16 year old? I mean, I know that both from experience, I know that from research, I know that from representing kids in juvenile detention centers, I know that from speaking with young people that that have been in prison. And I, and I'll just say, like, what does it mean if you're 14, 15, and you have never been away from home for more than a couple of weeks, and suddenly you are tossed into a world that is just completely unlike anything else you've experienced. But one of the, the challenges with even describing that is that one of the things that, that people want to hear is how violent prisons are. But if I make that argument, then that seems to suggest that prisons are the place for these extremely violent people. Mm. And so I don't want to necessarily make that argument except to say that it was the COs who were violent, it was the, you know, the, the mental health workers who were absent, it was the medical staff who frequently were unqualified, and sometimes there was a pocket of individuals that could frankly terrorize a prison that were always unaccounted for for reasons around the, the prison guard, the prison ratio, for reasons around the, 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 the actual architecture of the prison and for reasons around the actual protocol for, I think, for, um, for like how problems were managed at the institution. I think one of, um, and, I, I, and I, I'll, I'll end with just saying this, it's amazing to me that it's still okay to send juveniles to prison in the United States. And, and frequently we talk about this as if it is a new occurrence. But the, the, the tragic reality is that we have been treating juveniles as adults since the mid-1800s. And we have been sending juveniles to prison on a regular basis since at least that time period, even after the juvenile justice system was developed. And what people don't understand, I mean, they always want to anchor the conversation around people who have committed the most violent crimes. But what people don't understand is, is frequently young people who haven't committed the most violent crimes who end up with prison 
who end up in prison with adults. And the experience could drastically um, change your life for the worse for all kinds of obvious reasons. And let me just add that comparatively, this is something that also where the U.S. stands out because other countries don't sentence juveniles to these, you know, as adults to these incredibly lengthy prison terms. And when they hear about what happens, how we treat children, let's say it, that's the word, children in this country um, with life without parole or incredibly long sentences, it's something where they just say, this country's lost its mind. It's actually, like, it's actually amazingly different, though, right? And it's so irrational. So I, I had a client that was 15 years old. Because he was 15, he was being tried as an adult. Because he was 15, he couldn't be in lockup with adults for f during the trial, during the court process. But when you go to court, it's not as if you show up and you got a time slot. So if you get there on time, you get in and you get out. You show up at 7.30 in the morning, and you remain there into like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And because this kid was only 15, he couldn't be in lockup with all of the adults. So where was he? Basically, in a solitary confinement cell. And I had forgotten, I had forgotten just how, 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 how difficult it is to find a way to occupy your mind at 15 until I went to see him. And, and we went into the cell, me and my supervising attorney, to talk to him. And we actually had nothing to talk to him about, right? Because it was a foregone conclusion that he was going to plead guilty. So we had very little to talk to him about because all of the evidence suggested he did it. He told us that he did it. And, and I think that also complicates the plea bargain narrative is because how should we think about those cases? But the point was we were in that cell with him for 23 minutes talking about nothing because it looked like he was broken. And in fact, he was upset because his mother hadn't been answering his phone calls. And, and, I, and I, so I think when we, when we think about what the system does, it's one way to think about it on a sort of broad level. But it's a very different way to say, so what does this mean? He hasn't been convicted of any crime. Once he does plead guilty, if he pleads guilty, he'll probably get time served. But what does it mean for him to have spent basically three months going back and forth to court? Each time he went to court, he had to sit in a single cell by himself for eight hours. I'm glad that you touched upon this issue of solitary confinement. This is something that you have written about before. And in thinking about um, I, I think that we have kind of left this idea that this is about rehabilitation. And at the same time, there are people who find mechanisms to remain connected and grounded through the process. And so I in a sense, solitary confinement is one of many kind of excessive forms of punishment that has been rationalized um, within this system. And so from both of your perspectives, you know, the critique of solitary confinement, is there a global kind of response to that? And is yeah. there any way that we can make sure that people on the outside of this can really advocate to stop this practice? Well, you want me to take that? If, if you look comparatively, other countries in the world consider it torture, period. It's very simple. Um, there are exceptions where there's a particularly violent act in a prison where somebody gets separated for a day or two days, right? And every effort is made to help reintegrate that person, solve the conflict, start on a positive note. In this country, in most prisons, when somebody gets sent to solitary, it's minimum a month. It's often two months, six months, year or years, right? And then you have the process where when people go in for a long period of time, they start acting out. And so if they're acting out, what happens? They get more solitary, right? And so we create this process where we're causing psychological damage, and then as a result of that, we're giving them the exact same thing that's creating even more psychological damage. And then you have people who leave solitary and go right out on the street. I mean, there's no, it makes no sense. Well, that's what happened in, um, in, um, in Colorado, which is a, which is a yeah. good case, because um, the guy was locked up. He had been in solitary for a number of years, and he was released directly. And, and the interesting thing, though, is that I wish I knew his name, because I hate to talk about somebody and not remember that name. But the then director of the Department of Corrections in Colorado was reducing the number of people in solitary. And he was a part of a number of states, including Mississippi, including Washington State, that had been working to reduce the, the numbers in solitary confinement. So they released this guy who had been in solitary confinement for years. And the guy goes and murders the director of the Department of Corrections. And um, it was interesting, now I do remember this guy's name, what's interesting is Rick Ramish took his place. 
And the question became, what will Rick Ramish do in, in the face of this tragedy? Because you could easily ramp up solitary confinement, given this. Or, or may, I mean, actually, it seems like that's the only choice, to be frank. I, I was certain that he was going to ramp up solitary confinement. And, but what he did was he went to solitary confinement. And this is a New York Times op-ed piece that he wrote about it, which, which is actually interesting to me, because I spent like more than a year in solitary confinement. And that this grown man who was a cop, and, he, and I, I met him a few times. He's just like this tough guy, cop, been in the Department of Corrections for a number of years. He wrote the op-ed and said, frankly, I could do 20 hours. I think they let him have a cell phone, because then he called him and said, listen, yeah. I'm done. Please come open the cell and let me out. But he continued to decrease the numbers of solitary confinement after having experienced it, because I think one of the other things that happens in the context of this conversation is we imagine that the crime that got committed lasts not just forever for the purposes of you having a criminal record, but it's justification forever for whatever happens to you. And so we don't even need to, to imagine what it means to suffer through solitary confinement, to suffer through like improper, improper hygiene, improper medical treatment, mm -hmm. uh, and, and horrible food. You don't have to do that yourself because you deserve it for having committed that crime. He said, no, before I make a decision on what to do with this, let me, feel, let me understand what it means to be in a hole. And I heard him at a, the last time I was in a room with him, it was, was it, I wonder if I can say this, but um, I was at a conference. It was like a meeting of correctional administrators. And the, and the problem that they were addressing was how to decrease racial disparities within the system that, that they were responsible for. Understanding that it wasn't their fault, they, they have no role in people coming into prison. But there are things that they could do as administrators of Department of Corrections to decrease um, racial disparities in different points in the system. And on that, on that day, um, I, won't, I won't quote him exactly because I might misquote him, but I'm, I'm relatively certain that he said between 30 and 60% of the people locked up in Colorado could be released um, without being a threat to the community. Now, now, don't quote me on that. Don't put it on TV. Don't. <laughs> I doesn't, it was a joke. <laughs> this is a joke. And then, um, and then the last thing I'll say is my own experience, though. My own experience, interestingly enough, is that um, one of the aspects of solitary confinement that we don't discuss enough is protective custody. You actually have a wide swath of people who are in the hole, not because they've done anything wrong, but because they're afraid to be in population. And I don't know if it's anything. That's, that's actually more tragic than that. So I, I, was, I was in a hole once because I had ostensibly done something wrong that I still disagree with. But I was in a hole once for six months. And that guy beside me had been in a hole for years. Had been in a hole for years on protective custody. And it got so bad that, that they would try to release him. And then he was spazzed out just to get put back in a hole because for all kinds of reasons, he just felt like he couldn't manage being in a general population. Yeah, can I have one little thing on solitary confinement? At Georgetown, a Prisons and Justice Initiative, and in coordination with Martin Luther King Week and Let Freedom Ring festivities, we're actually hosting a two-week exhibit of a replica solitary confinement cell in a very central building on campus. And we're going to have two public events that focus on solitary and on the damage of solitary confinement. So this is a big theme that we're going to be addressing in the uh, coming weeks, starting next week. I hope you guys have to be real thoughtful about that. We I, are. Cause somebody did that before, and I really got upset with them. And it was, it was a problem. It was at the public library. And I went in to check it out. And I was walking around the space, and the woman came up to me, do you want to go in there? And I was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> and then I was like, all right, I'm going to go in. And then she said, well, I got to have your cell phone. And if you were at the conversation earlier, I have a real problem with people demanding my cell phone. I was like, you can't have my cell phone. But, um, and then me and her got into this back and forth. And she was like, well, you can't understand the experience. <laughs> and I was like, would you like me to take my shoes off as well? Uh, should I change clothes in the scrubs? Should we have a, 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 like a kangaroo court hearing before this so that I know how long I have to stay? And then she realized that I must know something of what I was talking about. And, and I think the danger in this is, is how, do we, how do we actually understand experiences? And I think sometimes we imagine 
walking into a cell under our own volition is in any way like what it means to be handcuffed and shackled and sometimes dragged into the cell. And I just don't think it, it, it equates, but I'll say well, can this. Can I tell you what we're doing? Because we're, yeah, we're please. not just letting people walk into the cell. Please. So one is that we're going to have uh, a video from the Rikers film, a 10-minute uh, uh, excerpt that focuses on solitary confinement that has people's personal testimonials. Two, we're going to have a formerly incarcerated person there every single day who's going to be talking to people about the experience. Right? And then three, we're going to have a, a, a system where people are reflecting and leaving their notes and, and taking it very seriously and, and contemplating it. Obviously, there's nothing that can actually replicate the experience, right? but we're trying to have people understand the gravity oh, of what yeah, it is. Yeah. And the biggest thing that I've found, and this can maybe segue into some other topics, that the general public doesn't understand and the, the, the sort of demonization of people who have committed crimes and so on, is that people don't get the experience of going and visiting a prison. And I've brought in hundreds of students into prisons, and I've brought in dozens and dozens of guests faculty members, colleagues, and so on, to give lectures in prison. And every single one of them walks out of there saying, that totally changed my life. Now, I can't do that for everybody, and it's actually really hard to get access to prisons and so on. But I'm trying to do in a very solemn, serious way, get people to think about how dehumanizing this experience is. And so this is a way of doing it, and I think we're taking appropriate measures. And I'll have you come visit to no, no, I'd like check that. up on what we We actually doing. set that up. I was going to criticize the project, and then he was going to further explain <laughs> That's it. That's right. Uh, no, but, but, but I, I like the thoughtfulness in, 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 in both having a the video and having somebody just actually And we're having two public yeah. events, that like each that. of which has three formerly incarcerated people who spent years in solitary. So there's a like big that. focus on the experience. That works. Throughout this conversation about solitary confinement, we're really touching upon the way that the racialization of the system often leads to changes in the conditions. And so when you talk about um, the juvenile justice system, as that system had more and more black children in it, that system became more and more committed to a certain type of penal process. And I want us to think about the ways that um, race and gender work together in this system because I think that um, people are often surprised to learn about the number of women who give birth in prison while shackled. Um, the various ways that transgendered individuals are put in solitary confinement in both a protective and punitive way. And so when we think about tackling this incredible system that has so many problems in it, um, what are the ways that we can think about this in terms of a gender justice, a racial justice, um, a, sexual, um, a, sexual, a sexuality issue, so that we can help mobilize different groups to make sure that they're also working on this. Because this cannot just be the work of the, of the people who want to reform the system. There are a lot of uh, people who need to be brought in. What are some of the ways we do that in order to create a sustainable movement to really change this? I guess, okay. yeah, I, I guess one thing I'll say, I mean, the, the, the question that you raise is really what kind of literacies do we need to bring to this question? And I, and I think that that hasn't been on the table when primarily what we were doing was critiquing the system. And so, you know, part of critiquing the system is providing the public with information that they don't have, like what it actually looks like to be inside the system. But I think a different question that we have to more thoughtfully engage with is what should the system actually look like? Because it's, it's, it's two different kind of conversations we can have. We can have a, a conversation about just how the system is motivated to do harm to specific communities and how the system does harm to those specific communities. But then we have research that challenges that. We have like James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, that's about DC, that's raising this question about what does it mean to have like a city that's advocating for some, some punitive policies? And what does it mean for that city to be advocating both for punishment and something else and not only get punishment? Because I think in, in some of these conversations we have, the only way for you to care about me as somebody who had been to prison is if I also went to Yale or... Um, Made that <laughs> <laughs> like, and it's funny, too, actually what's amazing is the number of people who, um, who bemoan the fact that I was incarcerated now. But when I was 16 in 1996, and this is around the time of the super predator, this is around the time of the crime bill, there were really few people bemoaning the fact that I was incarcerated. And even to this day, there are still very few people bemoaning the fact that that generation is incarcerated because those are now grown men who are 35 and 40 years old. And so what I think 
could bring us to the point that you're talking about is to begin to have more robust conversations about the policies that need to be changed to get people out of prison. Because once you start really asking about like concrete policies, like I will name four people that I need to get out of prison. And once I name those four people, I have to think about what has to happen to get those four people out of prison. And then I end up asking myself different questions about now what me and those people need to address to help them get out of prison. Too frequently we're talking about sort of broadly reforming the system, but we have no idea like what that should end up being in practice. One of my sort of biggest critiques, I got into this because I was a juvenile who went to prison. I didn't know that was a thing. And when I got to prison, I found out that it was a thing. I read a poem by Etheridge Knight called For Freckle Face Gerald. It was written in the late 60s, and it was about a 16-year-old that got raped in prison. I read that poem, and I realized that the thing that happened to me that I experienced, and I, I wasn't raped in prison, but the fact that I have to add that qualifier means something about how demeaning it is to suffer in prison, that even if you do suffer, you can't mention it out loud, because to mention it out loud is a different kind of suffering. But the point is, after I read that poem, I started to do studies. I, start, I started to study. I started to do research on the issue. And when I came out, I found a group of people that were dealing with it. And I thought, this is amazing. This is an actual organization, the Campaign for Youth Justice, that's attempting to answer this question, that's attempting to stop people from being incarcerated with adults. But a decade later, we have done very little to stop people from being incarcerated as adults. The men, and, and the men that I know who are in prison now, who serve time with me, are completely outside of the space of advocacy that was created by very dedicated and committed people. And I think if, I'm, if, if we start to ask questions about why are they outside of the space of advocacy, why has Granville, Florida not had nearly the impact that I believed it would have when on the cusp of the Supreme Court decision, I was at Georgetown Law School watching, I was on a panel discussing it, excited. All of that's been deflated. And I think if I start asking why, then I go to those other groups and how they need to bring their literacies and their expertise to really imagine what we want the system to look like, and maybe if we provided some different answers in that way, then, then we could provide some relief. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that the situation today or over the last few years is very different from 10 years ago, certainly 20 and 30 years ago, where it was all tough on crime, all punitive, more and more and more, lock them up longer and more of them and so on. And of course, them was, it was a code word, right, for certain types of people. Um, now, today, Obviously, the 2016 election throws a wrench in things and makes it a little bit complicated, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But there has been a movement building, and I do think that the fight against mass incarceration has become the civil rights movement of today. Yeah, I disagree. Tell me why. Because first of all, because I, I, I don't even, if somebody says name the mass incarcerated, who are they? I know that it's not me. People like me now because I went to Yale. When I pulled the pistol out on that guy and carjacked him, I was not amongst the mass incarcerated. And when we talk about this issue, and I name people I know, they are never amongst the mass incarcerated. And I've rarely been in rooms. Some, you feel different, primarily because you spend time in prisons, right. though, right? And so you actually have a kinship and a relationship that you've built over time period with men in prison, where you have a more robust understanding of their possibilities, their capabilities, their humanity. But a lot of us don't. And I mean, you said that we're in a very different space now than from 20 or 30 years ago. It's like saying that you know the knife was like 12 inches in my, in my back, and now it's nine. Because the, everybody I know is still in prison. So for me to say that it's different from 1996 to now, I have to be able to point to some people who I know who, because of our work, because of the policies we advocated, are no longer in prison. And I'm coming off of spending three years in law school trying to get one person an attorney, and having all of the, everybody who I respected who thought would give me a yes guys doing 63 years for a crime that wasn't a rape, that wasn't a murder, that wasn't a robbery. It was an attempt at capital murder where a gun never went off. He got 63 years in a state with no parole. And I could not get him an attorney from you know, some of the best people in the country. So for me to argue that things have changed, I mean, I would be lying to him. And I have to be accountable well, to I'll him. Well, I'll tell you what has changed. What has changed is awareness. And that may be step one out of 20, right? But not only, I'm not talking just from my own experience going inside, which has been incredibly influential, but I'm talking about spreading that, bringing people in. Also, my students, the millennial generation, I think, gets this issue in a way that prior generations didn't. 
first step is knowing about it. Then they all want to go to law school, or they all want to be public defenders, or they all want to be even ethical prosecutors, and so on. That's going to take a long time. I don't disagree. I'm in no way, and, and read the conclusion of my book, I'm in no way celebratory about where we are today. I'm saying we're finally having the right conversation. It's been framed in a way that says mass incarceration is an injustice. Now the next step is what do you do about it? I'm not popping champagne, and I won't for a long time, but there are people coming home. I just got a call. Marsha was there. I got a call 15 minutes before we started from a guy who came home in December who's speaking at Georgetown next week. There's another one who came home in October that I've gotten involved, and they, when they get involved, it's, it starts to spread. I want to pick up on this issue of coming home, though, because the re-entry polit policies of our time make this question of what is home and what is the condition of home and how you get to stay in that home and if you can apply for food assistance and if you can travel to a job. I mean, so while I think both of you are touching upon the ways that we positively and negatively understand the civil rights movement, it raised a lot of awareness, but it didn't change voter behavior and it yeah. in some ways streamlined racism in a more efficient system and at the same time it made people more reflective. But I think that a good place to kind of think about a holistic approach is to think about the real challenges of reentry. And so if we think about ourselves as committed to making sure four people come out, how do we ensure that four people are coming out into an ethical and, and dignified world to care? And this is, I think, yeah. the, the kind of last component of deepening this conversation. So I just make one, one quick point. I'm not denying that, that we haven't had change over the past 20 years. I'm denying that it's nearly as robust as it needs to be. I was once, at a, I was once in a conversation and I, Nicole Porter from the Simpson Project said that if we continue the rate of decarceration that we're at right now, it's going to take 80 years. Yeah. So if that's so that right there says we have had no change. 88 years? I mean, that's, that's the same. I'm going to be dead, you know, and I'm primarily concerned about me being a grandfather. So if I'm dead in 88 years and everybody else is still in prison, that's a huge problem. Um, and then in terms of reentry, um, you know, I, 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 I take all of this stuff personally. And, and the problem with me ever being involved in these conversations is that I don't know how to engage in a conversation without taking it intimately personal. Because it's not just about, like, it ain't even just about my experience. But it's about the experience of people I know who still struggle every day with stigma, who still struggle every day with the ways in which they're blocked from release. And then even if they get released, they're blocked from achievement. And I can't even complain about the things that I've endured because it sounds like complaining because I, I, I have accomplished a whole lot of things. But literally, at every step of the way, doors that I expected to, to be open with, with, with less fight have frequently required a kind of effort that we shouldn't expect anybody to have to exert. Because it wasn't just my effort. It was my wife's effort. It was my friend's effort. It was the communities that I was a part of. It was their effort. I had a full tuition scholarship to Howard University. This is the Mecca. When they found out I had a felony, it got denied. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's more difficult to hide the kind of um, ways in which we continue to punish people who have a criminal record when you apply to Target in a safe way. If, if they were willing to deny me at, at, at like institutions of higher education that I was qualified for, Imagine what's going on when you, and actually, it's, it's more, I've never told the truth. Let me stop there. Mark, what are your perspectives okay, about so this? So first off, I, I don't know what Dwayne just pulled, but there's some kung fu or voodoo or something, because I suddenly got cast as an optimist, which is <laughs> anything but the case. So please read the book, and it's called Unusually Cruel. <laughs> it's not called, like, the, you know, the road to success is here. Um, Sorry. I'm very... Uh, negative and very pessimistic <laughs> about what's been taking place. Okay, but I still will insist that there are seeds now through the younger generation in particular, through the use of narratives and stories, through Innocence Project and DNA, making people realize that all these mistakes are made. There's something with awareness and people are mobilized and upset about it. Now, Maybe then they just go home and they go back to their Instagram and they don't care and they don't do anything because that is a problem with that generation, right? But I think that there's an awareness and that that's meaningful and that's something that is to be encouraged and hopefully keep inspiring them. 
Now, in terms of reentry, um, it, it's it's a disaster, and that's the you know chapter seven of my book is on reentry, and there's no comparison to bring in the other countries here, France, Germany, and the UK that I look at. I mean, first of all, the period of incarceration is about getting people ready for reentry, right? Mm -hmm. They say the punishment is over, right? You you you. Your punishment is simply being separated from society. Prison is about trying to help you re-enter, help you get better. Okay, so whether it's job training, whether it's education, whether it's just the uh, so social services. I mean, in Germany, to become a prison guard, it's two years of training. Two years. It's essentially to become a social worker is to be a prison guard. Here, it's barely two weeks. It's that, you know, take some, a baton and some mace and go control the animals. I mean, that's essentially, you know, very different orientation. And then with re-entry, in European countries, they prepare people. They t explain to people how to ex talk about the fact that there might be a gap on their resume, right, when they are incarcerated. They're trying to support people. And then legally, other than certain sensitive areas, if it's working with children and there's a crime against children or financial crimes and certain types of jobs, but employers don't even have a right to know about why somebody was incarcerated. If it has no bearing on the job, it's a fresh start, right? In this country, there's no fresh start. We talk about second chances. First of all, many people didn't have a first chance, but then they don't even have a second chance when they come out. And it's a huge problem. And one thing I want to say about Dwayne, which is that, and I'll start it with a compliment, but since he's been so harsh on me, I'm going to turn <laughs> it into a criticism, which is that while everything about Dwayne's story is remarkable and is amazing and it's inspiring, and I think he actually recognizes that the sort of the Yale, you know, buzz and halo and so on is something that gets him this adulation from certain crowds, but what I would say is Dwayne is not exceptional. I know 30 Dwaynes right, that I could name who are just as smart, just as dedicated, just as capable, just as ready to come out and do amazing things. And they're not getting a chance to come out, or just yeah. a handful occasionally will trickle out. So that's my larger point, yeah. is not to say, let's celebrate Dwayne, but rather let's say, why aren't we letting out all the other Dwaynes in there who deserve a chance, and who are just as capable, and maybe even more so? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> And I, I was, I mean, and the first time I met Mark, it was, I mean, it was in a prison. It was in a prison, yeah. It was in a prison, and it was with a bunch of students in a program, and they were um, engaged and, and, like, ready and brilliant and sharp and compelling, and um, sometimes a little abrupt yeah. and aggressive. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. Um, I think you take a question from... I think, yeah. yes, but um, before I open it up to the audience, I think that this conversation is particularly illuminating because it helps us understand that the talents and gifts that we have right now where we are, we have an opportunity to move this boulder. And throughout this conversation, we've seen the importance of architecture, the importance of history, the importance of medicine, the importance of food science, the importance of physical science, that we are prepared to fight this because we bring different types of knowledge to this problem. And so one of the things that I'm so grateful for both of your work is you really help us understand not only the complexity of this issue, but you also challenge us to use our talents in order to upend this system. And so please join me in thanking our panelists before we open up for questions. All right, I will take questions from the audience. I remind you that a question is a search for knowledge rather than a reflection. So we will start with you in the blue shirt. And Christian has the microphone. Uh, hello, is this on? Hi, uh, my name is Dimitri. Thank you very much to all of you for your sh what you've shared and your experiences and your work on this very important subject. Um, it seems to me uh, tragically ironic what we're discussing now that Tocqueville's original purpose in writing Democracy in America and coming to America to write it was to study the American prison system. Yeah. And actually a lot of the points that he came up with he, he ended up writing, obviously everyone knows, a masterful work about many other subjects, but he did touch upon the prison system and about po possibly reducing prison sentences and the harshness of them. So I have two questions. Uh, one is, from what I understand, the, in the last 40 years, the, the population of people in prison has gone up dramatically. So I'm just wondering what the data show. Is it because of the war on drugs? What is it about that's, ha well, that's causing this? And obviously, I'm always interested in a comparative perspective globally. I thought what you said about the German w prison guards is spot on. Um, the other question I have is what some people call the prison industrial complex, that uh, 
how much of are they able to lobby inside Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and get their interests advanced and get the laws to privatize prisons, et cetera. And I, I hate to go there because I know you're, you're probably both JDs and there's a lot of lawyers in the room, but how much does the lawyer, is, how much is there a lawyer business criminal courtroom complex of economic interest? Because one of the things Tocqueville did say, and he, he d was obviously writing during slavery, and so it was incredibly, incredibly inequitable. But he did say America is much more equitable than France and other places. But one thing he pointed out is the ability of a poor person to get a lawyer or to get a well or get it, to get a competent lawyer. So thank you very much. Sorry for speaking so long. Question of population. Yeah. Well, let me actually. You mentioned Tocqueville. I start out the book with a quote from Tocqueville who says, um, "Well, actually, uh, I start out the preface. I'll just throw this one out there and move on." But because uh, Dwayne's been telling his personal story. Uh, the preface, the first line, is little did I know at the time, but this book originated in the summer of 1985 when I was an adolescent sitting in a jail cell in London. So hopefully that makes you want to read on. But um, in terms of the, the actual book, it starts out literally the first words of the first chapter, Alexis de Tocqueville. And I talk about how he was so astute in terms of understanding American democracy, but actually completely missed, or at least missed where predicting where it was going to go, criminal justice, because he actually has this, uh, this quote about, uh, in no country is criminal justice administered with more mildness than it is in the United States. Right? And you could just do a 180 on that one. So, um, but in terms of what explains uh, this, and it really it's a phenomenon that's over the, the last 40, 50 years, starting in the mid-1970s. The war on drugs is a key part of it, but also there's an important role that's been played by prosecutors right, in, in pushing for convictions. There's a sort of professionalization of prosecutors. But even branching out further from that, if you look at society, I emphasize four main factors. One is race, and so this follows the Michelle Alexander argument that after uh, enfranchisement of African Americans after the end of Jim Crow, that locking African Americans, particularly men, up became the new way of trying to have racial control. Right? Um, second is religion. Right? Starting in the mid-1970s, you had a very politicization of what had often been a private sphere with a very much of a punitive eye for an eye, lock them up, that was also infused with some implicit racial images. Right? And, th so, and then you had politics, which is something also where the US is very exceptional. This is the only kind, people in other countries are just shocked when I tell them that we in this country elect prosecutors, elect judges, that they run campaigns, that they fundraise, that they have political advertisements, that they, they brag about how many people they sentence to death and so on. Um, there's something utterly bizarre about the way in which judicial politics is politicized. It's something that should be a meritocracy. It's something that should be based on careful reasoning and logic, not about fear-mongering through, through commercials and, and, and fundraising and so on. And then the fourth is what you mentioned, the prison industrial complex, which is a loaded term, but it's really about business. And as this system has been built up, and in the 1990s, there was a new prison being built every 10 days. Every 10 days, a new prison was opening. It's astounding, right? There was a huge business. People always talk about private prison companies and don't realize that's actually only about 8.8% of prisons. So people have the sense that they're everywhere private prisons. But they've had a lot of influence. And there's been through lobbying and so on, and, and also the private uh, companies that work within public prisons. Um, there are a lot of vested interests in keeping uh, mass incarceration very high. So unless we're going to have change in terms of how people think about race and practice racial punitiveness, which starts in the schools, by the way, as you mentioned, very young, um, unless we have changes in religion. I think there's some movement there in terms of a more redemptive uh, approach and more tolerant approach uh, of second chances through religion that's changing a little bit. Um, politics, I don't see any change there. It's still you know, tough on crime, still wins. Um, and then the business is still very deeply entrenched. So you know, it's an uphill battle, but I think those are the four main features that explain this American exceptionalism. Do you want to say something about legal representation? Yeah, and I and I'll just add another piece. When the prisons, when when you had this boom and the increase in the yeah. prisons being built, you also had federal policy that said I'll grant you um, federal funds, federal grant money to build prisons if you get rid of parole. So you had two things happening. So we might have slowed down on the building of prisons, but we haven't had a comparative kind of federal policy that's trying to find ways to encourage people to encourage states to reinstitute parole. So, right, so we uh, open up the front doors and close the back right. doors simultaneously. And, and the same thing goes for the Pell Grants at the time. You shut right. down Pell Grants, and they haven't returned despite this sort of years of reform. You haven't had a return in the Pell Grants, which one would suspect given the kind of political climate that changed. The, the question about the lawyers is difficult, though, because most lawyers, most public defenders don't make any money right. at all, right? 
I mean, you lucky if, if you work if, if you work here in D.C. and you get a public defender, you got one of the best lawyers in the country. You could work in some other states and you get a public defender. You might not have one of the best lawyers in the country, but it's kind of like criticizing a teacher who has a classroom with 50 students in it, but not being as skilled as like a private school teacher who has a classroom with like 15 students in it, right? It's this question of one, caseload, two, training, three, the burden of student loans that a lot of public defenders come into the, into the office with. And all of that, I think, creates almost a, a impossibility of, of providing um, just representation. Actually, I'm going to take another. Why couldn't he get a lawyer? Oh, I, let me just. Yeah, I, return to that. I, and, then, and then I'll switch. He could get a lawyer because he had already been convicted. So he had been convicted. And, and you are, you're entitled to have an attorney during your trial. You aren't entitled to have an attorney post-conviction. And if you lose your appeal, then you really aren't entitled to have an attorney at all. So frankly, anybody who has DNA that they want to introduce aren't entitled to an attorney to help them prepare that habeas petition. And there's all kinds of deadlines that you have to meet that it's no reason for you to know if you're incarcerated. So, and EPA, which goes back to Clinton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, in the red. And my motion just passed. Hi, my name is Isabel and I work at New America. I just have a question. I know that there's federal prisons and there's, there's state or, or local or county prisons. And um, I'm curious if there's um, a distinction in terms of um, of how the, the prisons are run and treatment within prisons, as well as policy between the state and federal level, and what what advocacy looks like at the state and at the state level versus the federal level, and if the prospects for one are better for the other. Obviously, I'm sure they're better in quite yeah, I think states. I think the differences are so many and so profound that it is. I, I don't know if there's a way to begin to answer that question. Except I will say that. Like you have somebody like Mark Osler who started a federal clemency project that could exist on the federal level and actually be a blueprint for things that could be re reproduced on the state level, but, but it's more difficult to reproduce on the state level because you don't have the sort of drug, the drug policies and the drug laws that have been sort of, sort of um, peeled back. You don't have that on the state level necessarily, but I think there's so many differences from doing time in a state prison to a different state prison to a prison in a different state to a prison in a a different federal, I, I just, it's a lot, I mean, it's impossible to, to really quantify how different the experience is for one person in the state of Maryland being at Jessup as opposed to another prison on the Jessup yeah. compound right. that's like five minutes away. Yeah, yeah, no, there's huge variation, it's hard to generalize, but overall the standard is pretty terrible across the board. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing with, uh, prison conditions that, and there's there's a lot of research on programming, and that's something that varies across prisons. That might just be a function of who's the warden in one particular prison, which could change when that warden changes, or it might be at the state level or county level if there's sort of more resources put in. It might be depending on where the prison's located. If there are a lot of volunteers in the area, uh, then prisons benefit. Nearby. If there's college nearby, um, I was at San Quentin just a month ago. And I've been there several times. San Quentin is is a unique prison in the United States. Now. There are people there who qualify for minimum security who could be at other facilities, but who ask to stay at San Quentin, even though their cells are four by nine, four feet wide by nine, and they're double celled, two people in that space. But they choose to be there because of the program, because of the fact that it's in Marin County, because of the fact that there are volunteers, whether it's Berkeley, Stanford, or other institutions, or clubs in Marin County, and the administration in San Quentin is incredibly welcoming. So they have all kinds of education programs. They have training programs. They have Shakespeare clubs. I mean, podcast. I was talking to the, they have a podcast, Ear Hustle. I met all those guys. They're amazing. The thing, the thing that's so clear, and this is why it becomes a no-brainer in my mind, which is that programming works. Education, it's incredibly clear. If people get an education when they're in prison, if they even just take some higher education courses, it reduces recidivism by 43%. It makes them prepared to reenter. It changes their mindset. And I've literally seen it happen with my own eyes in the eyes of my students in front of me. It activates them in a way. It's something that's cheap, in, in many cases free, because they're often volunteers. Um, and it's something that is humane, and it's something that makes sense. It keeps society safer for when people get. I mean, think about it. 95% of people in prison, even though they're in there for way, way too long, at some point they're going to come out. Right? And who do we want them to be? Right? Who do we want to be living next door? Who do we want to be sharing this community with? We want people to be well-equipped to return. And this is something we're doing at Georgetown. We're starting a program right now in the D.C. jail, literally this month, a prison education program, something that we feel at Georgetown and the D.C. Department of Corrections 
feel the same about this. This is something that, it's a win-win for everybody. Right? And there's, this is something that I think more prisons should be doing. And I wish there were ways of measuring and evaluating prisons more precisely to reward those who have more programming and perhaps punish in some way those who don't because the results go along with it. It's very clear. More, better education and programming, better results. And why would anyone oppose that? Um, on the topic of education, um, I don't know if you heard recently the New Jersey prison system banned the new Jim Crow from. It just got overturned today, actually. Yeah, I'm so curious about like policies like that in general, yeah. which seem like minutia, but how you know how we can stay vigilant to make sure that things like that that appear very malicious on the surface, how we can fight that since they are so varied and spread out across the country. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of stuff happens all over the place. That was pr I don't know for sure, but that was probably a decision made by some administrator without any consultation and then when there was some uproar and Michelle Alexander got involved and then uh, the governor uh, overturned that and now it's considered not contraband. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling, especially New Jersey has the highest over-representation of African Americans of any state in the country, right? And for there, for the new Jim Crow, which is exactly making that point to be banned, think about the irony there. Um, but reinstituting it, Okay, it's good, but it's absurd that it was even banned for a second, and it's not really something to celebrate. But I think it just goes to show this is often what we're up against. We're up against administrators here and there just making decisions, arbitrary rules. When you work in a prison, there just are, are crazy things. You can do something one day, you can't do something the next. And then, you know, for people when they're themselves subjected to it, it's bad enough for volunteers coming in or trying to run a program, but when people are subjected to it themselves, you know, it, it, it's utterly, you know, dehumanizing and disempowering. And that's probably the purpose. Or at least, I mean, at least the, the practice is usually invisible. Mm -hmm. So, like, whether or not that's the purpose, you got right. some, some bureaucrat who is really had never read the New Jim Crow, and there was probably a whole host of other books that, that were on that list, too, that had never been read by anybody, and it might have just got banned based on the person that requested it. So I think if right. you ask what can you do, I mean, one thing that people who are interested in the issue could do is to find ways to be more mindful of the state regulations and a particular prison regulation, so that when the prison is saying, and, 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 and just follow organizations like the Prison Policy Initiatives that's always doing great work around like visitation and around certain phone issues, calls. phone calls and things like this. They have a, a serious pernicious effect on both people incarcerated and people who aren't incarcerated that could completely fly under the radar because it's not gonna get reported on the national news. But I think it should be. And there are, fortunately, something like the Marshall Project and other yeah. news media are starting to give more coverage to this. And so I think that you know, every state, state should have a spotlight shown on it in terms of their practices, whether it's censorship, whether it's just different policies in terms of visitation. You know, a prison I went to that, you know, suddenly they would say, you know, you can't greet the person when you come for a visit. So you used to do it. Imagine your, your kid comes to you. Imagine you're locked up. You get a visit from your child that you don't see very much, and you're not allowed to hug that child. What kind of message is that sending? You're not allowed to take pictures when you used to do before. There are these rules that come up. There's no rationale for it other than mm -hmm. they can. Right. And I'd like to reach a point where they cannot anymore because enough attention would be paid and enough outrage would be, would be raised. So three-part question, and you all can decide which of the three you want to answer, and it's, it's kind of micro to macro. First is, um, so we just talked about individual action. So for the person, that individual that does become enlightened about this issue and wants to do something, you touched on a couple of resources, but I'm wondering if there is a resource or place that folks can go to just to learn about ways that they might get involved and do action. Second question the is- The footnotes of his book. And footnotes of, <laughs> great idea, <laughs> which we will have outside. Um, and then for programs that work, so you're right, there are evidence-based programs that work. I'm curious if you can cite another example of two or things that we should be advocating for that we know exists and can change the outcomes um, for the folks that we're talking about. And then my third question is at a, at a systems level, which is we started talking about this, right, which is some of the obstacles being dehumanization of the person that gets caught up in the system, dehumanization of the experience itself, where what is it like to be in solitary confinement? Folks that really don't care about black and brown people to the extent that they understand the disproportionality of the people impacted. We will continue to build awareness 
then what? How do we start to really shift the tide towards action? What does that look like? And we've started to see bipo bipartisan support on this, I think in part because of the dollars that are flowing into this area, but I'm just curious if you have thoughts on what's that shift that's beyond a programmatic level or an individual level, but you really start to see institutional and systemic change. Let me take the third okay. one. So the, the, the third one, I think um, I did this project when, when, when the law school, we sort of studied the, so the highest rate of recidivism, and I hate words like recidivism because there's so much buried in it. What does it mean to recidivate? For instance, in, in, in Connecticut, the, right, it means the, the highest rate is parole violation. But a parole violation can literally mean, like I watched one hearing and I was sitting in on these hearings and they didn't know that I'd been formerly incarcerated. They just knew that I was a Yale law student. And one guy was living with his girlfriend who just had a child. And he would be staying there overnight. He had an ankle bracelet. He would stay there overnight because he was the caregiver when she was at work. They violated his probation for not being at home. So during the hearing, they stepped him back for eight months. At the end of the hearing, he said, can I change my address, right? And I just thought, maybe he's about to move to another country. And uh, he gave the address of his girlfriend. And the parole board said, that's fine. So he got violated for going to his girlfriend's house. And then upon his release, he was given permission to go there. So this is just completely a waste of eight months. And, and so the question is, what can we do besides being informed that this is happening? And, and we studied for a few months and consistently technical violation, technical violation, technical violation. None of it was serious enough to warrant another criminal offense. All of it led to somebody doing more time in prison between three months and a year more in prison. One of the things that we could do is find ways to be on the parole board. Like the, this is like an administrative agency with, with, with broad discretion and zero oversight. And nobody I know has ever said, I would like to be on a parole board. Like we haven't really thought about how to make up of people who are in those positions. I, I mean, I actually think administrative law is, is the way that we have to really think about changing and decreasing the prison population. Because it's people who are already in prison. You're not getting back in court. You're not gonna be resentenced. So we really have to thoughtfully figure out how to make clemency work, how to make parole work. And I will say, I was in a state that I won't name in which I was visiting that parole board and it was a local pastor that was on a parole board. And it was a public defender that was the head of the parole board. And that gave a different face to the problem as opposed to Connecticut, which was two correctional officers who only got those positions because they had reached retirement age and wanted to be able to get part-time salary, who were completely uninvested in, 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 in the people who they were seeing on a constant basis. And I got to him. So that's, that's my one way in which I would say that this is what we could do to change some of these policies and to put a real dent in, in incarceration rates. And then the second thing is, I think we have to be worried about how we, how we think about what evidence is and how we think about what recidivism is. Because there will be somebody that's released from prison who is unable to get a job, who commits another crime, even if they do have a degree. And I think that we really have to be careful about the ways in which, because look, all of you people in the audience who have a college degree, when you, if, if you ever do anything despicable in your life, your institution does not get blamed for it. Like if you cheat on your wife, if you beat your kid, if you get a traffic ticket, right? If you commit a crime, nobody says you went to University of Maryland, University of Maryland has failed our society. Like we, we can't keep sending students to University of Maryland because you got that education and you still decided that it was okay to run that red light consistently for six consecutive months, right? And so I think it's dangerous for us to put that kind of burden on, um, on higher education or any program in the system, because all of those are legitimate, even if people go through those programs and still end up back in prison, they're still legitimate. Let me add a point about parole and then answer the question directly. I mean, on parole, the problem is a lot of times those are governors who are appointing right. members of the parole board, and that's often rewarding people for their loyalty, but it's also part of the whole political nature of it, which is to say that what governors most fear is letting somebody out who commits another crime. Right? That is the number one fear. Right? And so in Germany, they talk about having a relatively high risk tolerance, which is to say they do their best, but when someone reaches the end of their sentence or has a conditional release earlier, which is a form of parole, that then we as a society are, are hoping for the best. And with the emphasis on rehabilitation that comes in, they have fewer failures. But the point is, 
we're not going to have 100 percent, whatever programs they do and whatever the conditions are. But we have to be, and I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times this summer about parole, which is that we have to be willing to consider letting people out of prison at some point. We have people who serve life with parole, right? So many, that, that, that sentence is just given out like candy, right, in courtrooms. Life, life. And they're eligible for parole. But then what happens is when they come up for parole at a certain point, what Serious happens? The and they might be 30 years into their incarceration. They might be all gray or whatever. And then it goes back to what they did when they were 16 or 18 or whatever. And it's the nat original nature of the crime. And nothing about the transformation that's happened in between. I've written 35 different parole letters. None of them has done any good. Because in a certain number of states, life basically means, you're, even though you're eligible for parole, you don't get a chance to get parole. So it's essentially life without parole, but we have this charade that we call trying for parole. Um, so I think parole is hugely problematic, but it is, it is an area where there needs to be a lot of attention because the sentencing part, that is changing a little bit. I mean, there is some you know, ramping down, three strikes and mandatory minimum and so on, but that's going to take a long time to have an effect on the 2.3 million people who are locked up today. Parole is where we can make a difference. California, due to a Supreme Court decision that the state was initially very reluctant to accept, has actually been giving out parole much, much more regularly now because they were forced because of overcrowding and conditions and horrific situation in their prisons there to let people out. And there are all these, you know, Scalia and many others were saying, you know, oh, there's going to be, you know, crime waves and so on. It hasn't happened, right? It's been incredibly successful. And it's not 100%, right. but it's been successful. And we as a country need to think about that and prepare for that and do everything we can to make that happen. Right. Now, in terms of, of uh, what can be done, you know, I've talked about programs and so on. The other thing is family. I think we, we, the way we treat people in this country when we lock them up, we do everything possible to prevent them from maintaining strong, healthy ties with their family. They get sent far away. You know, in the federal system, they get sent all over. And people from D.C. get put in the federal system, by the way. But even many states, they're put, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're in sort of rural areas that are really far away from where many people are from. And the visitation policies are very restricted. People will have to go overnight. That no, no public transportation will get there. We need to completely rethink this. Again, who do we want coming home? We want people who have strong, healthy ties. But this way it's set up now is meant to actually break those ties and discourage them. Um, but finally, in terms of where, where we can go, the reason why, and I want to come back, not quite be an optimist, but at least have some hope, which is that on the state level, right, there has been some change in some states. And, you know, in the end, we have 51 criminal justice systems in this country, right? We have the federal system in 50 states. And there have been states, and even some, some you know, deep red states, Texas, Louisiana, that have been horror shows for decades, but that have been moving in a different direction, locking up fewer people, being willing to let people out, and so on. It's not always for the same reasons I would share. A lot of it is economic, let's be honest. They're just saying, our budgets are bursting, we need to cut our budgets, why are we spending you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year to be locking up this person? Why are we spending $100,000 a year to lock up someone who is elderly and who has a lot of health needs? Let's just let them out earlier and it'll save our budget. I think of it from more of a human rights perspective, but that still is real, right? And that's an argument that's effective with certain crowds. And I think that there's some hope that the combination of those types of arguments will make people realize on a state level, where it's separate, where they're not part of all the federal craziness and so on, that there are better solutions that they can come to. So, you know, diverging to drug courts and so on. Again, it's happening for racialized reasons now that it's sort of a white population that's being viewed as you know, being addicts and it's not criminals anymore, so on. That should have happened 30 years ago, right? But um, there's some movement on the state level in that direction. And that's where I think that more attention needs to be paid is in the states. But maybe it's better that there's less attention. Maybe, maybe happening quietly in the background without all the sort of fear-mongering is a better way. And I, I just will say one thing that I think is, um, is, is I think worth noting. Um, you talk about like new, sort of bringing new literacies to the problem. Frank Geary and his students did a project with um, Impact Justice and the Yale School of Architecture. And he had students building prisons. And there was some pushback. I remember somebody hit me up on Twitter and was like, you know, I'm completely against this. And they tagged me. And I was like, well, I disagree with you. I think it's a good idea, you know. And um, You like and to do that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the reasons why I thought it was a good idea is because I was there and I watched him present. And one of the things that did was 
it's not a given that all of us know what it means to be incarcerated. It's not a given that all of us know what this system looks like. And so when you start to bring a diverse group of people to the problem, they start to ask different questions. And when those students built their prison, each prison like was built with this notion that the prison and the community shouldn't be two distinct places. And it should be far more porous than it is. Whether it was a community center, a library, a theater, they all conceptualized as it being some kind of space in which it was far more porous than what it is now. And they also all had built spaces or imagined spaces being built that took for granted the fact that the families of prisoners needed to be able to have a meaningful and kind of complex interaction with their incarcerated partners, children, loved ones. And so, you know, one of the reasons why I think that we need to bring others into this conversation is because they say the same thing that me or Mark might say, but, but they raise different questions like, oh, Red Onion State Prison has no family access because it's built into the side of a mountain that's 17 hours away from the entire prison population. So actually, I just wouldn't choose to build it on the side of a mountain in that place. And then if I built it, I would actually have a space for restorative justice. I would have a space that I imagine as using as a community theater. And doing all of those things, I think, encourage us to think in a different way about those incarcerated. Because although I agree with all of the systemic racism, although I agree with all of the sort of structural problems that lead to over-incarceration, the other reality is that we don't like people who are in prison. We just don't like them. Sometimes they are cousins, and we don't like them. And we don't like them because we disappear them. Mm -hmm. And we don't engage with their existence. And we don't meet them, especially if they aren't our families. We just don't meet them on a level in which we can imagine that they are more than the most horrific crime we could think of. Because we aren't even actually thinking about real crimes when we think about people incarcerated. We're thinking about the, the, the stand-in crime, which is something that we saw in Law and Order. Yeah. How's that show been out for 30 years? Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Ten spin-offs. I love NBC, though. No. <laughs> well, on that note, I just want to um, tell everyone that um, both Dwayne and Mark have books available through our partner, um, Solid State Books. And in a time that has been characterized by um, this idea of building a wall, I really appreciate to help your help in um, breaking down not only physical ones, but ideological ones as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you.